going in EBC. So, listen, I bid you greetings from sunny Southern California, um, where the rest of my clan also says hello, and my wife says hello. In fact, many of you are connected with her on Facebook, and, um, you know, I think that you guys probably know more about, some of you know more about what's going on in my house than I do. Because my wife is an oversharer. Now, she doesn't think so, but the kids would agree with me. So she thinks she's better than she's been. So um, I guess, you know, we take what we can get. But um, listen, I guess, um, you know, my wife may, she probably overshares, but I'm not even on Facebook at all. So I undershare. So I guess we balance each other out. Amen. Um, but listen, today and throughout the month, as um, Sister Adams talked about, we're celebrating 140 years of um, Elizabeth Baptist Church in this community and beyond. And um, can you imagine this place for 140 years ago? Let's stop and think about that for a moment. Yeah. That's 1883. What? 18 years after the Civil War ended. Seven years after Reconstruction. You remember Reconstruction? That's where they were supposed to reconstruct everything they had burned up, I mean, everything they had torn up and blew up and the whole country. And then after a few years, they finally just gave up. This place, this community started, that was the backdrop. Most of the people who would have attended the church at the time couldn't even read or write. Think about it, they, many of them would have been former slaves. And whose idea was it to start this church anyway? I mean, where did they even get the resources? But why did they even feel the need to start this church 140 years ago? Now listen, I'm asking a lot of questions, but I don't know the answers. <laughs> my, 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 my association with Elizabeth Baptist Church started 25 years ago in 1998. So I'm not here to give you a history lesson on EBC. I suspect there are people who are much more qualified to do that than me. So that's not why I'm here, but I will tell you this. Why I am here, what I do want to, I don't even really want to talk too much about EBC's history, period. What I prefer to discuss is EBC's legacy. And not just the church's legacy, but your own. Are y'all ready to spend some time with me just for a few minutes grinding and digging into the word and shut out all this noise that Pastor Craig was talking about, all the stuff that's going on around us? Let's just dig and go deep and listen and see what the Holy Spirit has to say to us today. You with me? Well, listen, let me ask you, let me give you a quote. There's a famous quote that asks, it says, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Does anybody remember who said that? You can just shout it out. Who, who said it? John F. Kennedy. When did he say it? He said it in his 1961 inauguration speech, inauguration speech. And you know why he said it? Y'all were going pretty good. <laughs> I, didn't think, I didn't know if you would know that. But listen, that, no, that's good. He said it to spur America on to service. He wanted people to stop thinking about what they can get from the country and start thinking about what they can give to the country. And, and, and so two months after he was inaugurated in March, he announced the Peace Corps. And it gave everybody an opportunity to serve, not even just in this country, but all throughout the world. And, and, and so, in, in fact, I can't tell you how often I hear people discussing the impact that their church has on them. And that's great. But today we want to flip the script because, you know, what we want you to evaluate is not the impact that the church has had on you, but the impact that you that can have on the church. Anybody with me? 
And, 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 and so, you know, because honestly, when I read the Bible, that's the way it's presented. It's not presented as this big organization that's doing anything. It's presented as a whole bunch of people who are connected as individuals going out and changing the world. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today as we remember our legacy. But first of all, I need to give you a definition of legacy. Now, I didn't put this in your, I don't think I put it up there, and I didn't put it in your note. The reason I did that because I want you to listen and write this down for yourself. Here's the definition of legacy. It's a long-lasting impact of particular events or actions in a person's life or in the past. So let me say that again. The long-lasting impact of particular events or action that took place in the past or in a person's life. Now, I want you to write that because when you write things down, you remember it better than when I write it and you read it. And the other reason I, wanted to, I did this is because I forgot to give it to Jason and for him to put it on the notes. <laughs> but listen, let's go into the Word. Let's look at a few scriptures and let's see, this, let's see this bear out. Let's start with Matthew 16, verse 13 through 19. A very common passage of scripture, but I want you to re- we're going to read it a little different way. We're going to read it from the NIV. But here's what, here's what, it's gonna, here's what it says. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do these people say that the Son of Man is? You guys know the scripture. And they replied, well, some say you're John the Baptist, and some say you're Jeremiah, or some say you're Elijah, or some of the prophets. They say, well, but who do you say that I am? What about you? And here's what they said. Listen to what they said. Then Simon Peter, you know, the spokesman for the group, he wasn't always the smartest. Sometimes people think that the person speaking is the smartest, but when you, sometimes when people speak, they let you realize that they're not that smart at all. So just because Peter spoke all the time doesn't necessarily mean he was the smartest, but look what he said. He said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. This time he was right. And listen to what Jesus told him. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. We're getting somewhere. So, but look at, but, but, but then look at, let's finish it though. Look at verse 18. He says, and I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades, where it means hell, will not overcome it. Listen to what he says. He said, now that you know who I am, let me tell you who you are. You're Peter. You're the rock that I'm going to build my church on. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And nothing will be able to overcome it. And look what he said in verse 19. He says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, we're getting this. So what did we just find out? Jesus makes it clear that he's going to build something new for himself called the church. And it's going to stand against any and everything out there. There's something called a church. It was a new thing. And he also makes it clear that this church would be built on what? On human beings. Y'all hear that? Not angels, not heavenly beings, human beings. Even as fallible as Peter. Listen to this, human beings, starting with his own disciples who were all Jews. Everybody say all Jews. Jews. That's the truth. They were God's chosen people. We're going to start there, Peter and the rest of them. Okay, so we got that. But now look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19 and 20 because I want you to see something. Let's build on this a little. Because when you go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, you start to see that, look what it says. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. Let's make certain we understand the context. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, a bunch of Gentile believers. And he has gone through the process. In fact, do me a favor, brother, let's go back to verse 
13. Let's back up here because I want to make certain you get the context of what's going on here. And then we can talk about this building process. Look at verse 13. Listen to what Jesus said. But now, he's talking to these, these Ephesian believers, these Gentile believers. But now, in Christ Jesus, you were once far away. But you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Look what he says in verse 14. This is what he says. For he himself, this is, this, this, this is what you got to understand. He himself, this is what Craig was talking about a moment. He himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. He said Jesus has destroyed the wall of hostility. This is what he said. This is what he said. He's telling the Ephesian believers this. He wants them to know. Look what he wants them to know. Keep going. Look at verse 15. By setting aside in his flesh the law with his commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two. One new humanity out of two. Thus making peace. Keep going. Let's go. Look at verse 16. He say, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. By which he put to death their hostility. All the hostility between Jews and Gentiles and any other group, Jesus put it to death on the cross. But why it, doesn't it not seem dead where we are? Keep going because he's not finished. Now look what he says at verse, in verse 17. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away. This is what he's saying. You Gentiles, you were far away. You were far away. And to those who were near, he preached the same peace to the Gentiles who were far away and to the Jews who were near. And look now verse 18. Look what he says. For through him, we both have access to the Father by the Spirit. Paul continues to use two groups, both, two, become one, us, we. Now look at what he says in the next verse. So consequently, in other words, therefore, you are no longer foreigners. He's talking to the Gentiles. And back in 1883, he would have been talking to black folk. I wish somebody was willing to go deeper into this. He wants everybody in the cross to know that you're no longer secondhand citizens in the kingdom. But you are fellow citizens with God's people. And also the members of his household. That household is what we're talking about. That household, Paul calls it the household. Jesus calls it his church. We're talking about that body. Now look at verse 19. You can start to understand. Because that body, that church, that household, it was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. But Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone. So he told Peter, that I'm going to build my church, y'all the rocks, that I'm going to build my church on, I'm going to build it on y'all, but I'm the chief cornerstone. I'm the one who put everything together and makes it fit nicely. For you folks in construction, Brother Ricard, brother Sean, you would call him, he's the load-bearing wall. You move him out, the whole thing comes down. He's the weight-bearing wall. Whoa, he's the chief cornerstone. He puts it all together. You're with me so far? Okay. So Paul wants these Gentile believers to know that they are fellow citizens with God's people, the Jews, in this new house that was going to be built on the apostles and the prophets, but Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Everybody with me so far? All right, then, let's keep going, because now let's go to Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. And let's look at this, because let's look at glimpse or glimpse of life in this new thing called the church. Let's read verse chapter 4 and verse 32. All the believers, it says all, and we know we're Bible scholars, so we know all means what? 
That's what it means. <laughs> All the believers were one in heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. That's what it says. They shared everything they had. Keep going. It says, and with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. Keep going. That there were no needy persons among them. And from time to time, those who owned land and houses, they sold them. And they brought the money from the sales. You know what they did with it? They put it at the apostles' feet. And they distributed it to anyone who had need. Let's dig into that a minute because we're talking about this new, a glimpse of this new thing called the church. But look what it said. They, 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 those who had it, go back to verse 35 again. It's, look, what, look at verse 35. It says that, that they put it at the apostles' feet and they distributed it to anyone who had need. Hmm. Look at verse 34. Those who had it, those who owned. Listen, let me explain something to you folks before we get too deep in this because you may miss it. God isn't going to ask you to do anything that he don't give you the power and the resources to do. Amen. So don't get concerned that I'm going to show up here and you think I'm going to tell you that you need to give all your money to EBC. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying for those who have it, watch what happens. Watch this. I want you to see this. Look down at verse 36 because everything that's going on in that early church, one man was mentioned. One. Joseph. We don't even call him by that name. A Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement. Look what Joseph did. He sold the field that he owned, and he brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Listen. Listen here. As you consider our own, your own impact on the church's legacy. Let's use the next 25, 30 minutes or so to use Barnabas' example as our guide. Let's do that because let's talk about what we know about Barnabas. Let's look at this because if you look at uh, Acts 36, Acts 4, 36, and 37, you'll see something as soon as he's introduced to us. Look at what we find when he's introduced to us. The first thing we know is he was committed to the discipleship process. That's the first thing we know. He was committed to the discipleship process. How do I know that? Because the apostles, he was not an apostle at this time. He was not a church leader at this time. He was not a preacher at this time. I wish somebody heard me. That's not the way we were introduced to Barnabas. We were introduced to Barnabas as just somebody who owned the plot of land and who saw the need of the church. He trusted the vision of the elders and the apostles and he took what he had and he sold it and he gave it to them for the benefit of the church. Somebody had to do that back in 1883. Somebody had to make some sacrifices. Somebody did more than just show up every other week and said, yeah, EBC is my church. Somebody did more than that. And somebody did more than that in this early church. And we know one somebody, his name was Barnabas. And the apostles gave him a reputation. What else we know about him? He was an encourager. You know what that means? That means he put other people first. When you are an encourager, that means that you got to be willing to spend time and listen to what's going on with people so that sometimes all you need to do is listen and then sometimes it's time to speak. But you can't start speaking when you don't really know the people that you're speaking to. 
They view that as judgmental. But when you know their situation, and when you are walking with them through their situation, they view that as love, love and guidance. Is somebody with me? It could be the same words. But the people that you're saying them to are going to view them differently. And, 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 and so, listen, um, back home last week, I, I, I got a letter from, from my pastor out there, and he said that he was inviting a few of us. I really don't know how many there were. I, I got the, the, the I, I felt like it was probably around 40, 50. I don't really know that there's um, 2,500, 3,000 people in the church, so I don't really know how many he was going to invite to this small meeting. But in the letter... He said it was going to be an intimate dinner, and he said he wanted to discuss something that God placed on his heart. And then he joked with us. He joked in the letter, he said, and be sure to bring your checkbooks because I will be asking for money. <laughs> and, and, but, but he went on to tell us, he said, God has placed something on my heart. He said, because in the last 12 to 15 months, there are 500 people who have connected and either been baptized or connected to our church. He say, and the Lord has placed something on my heart to do. He didn't tell us in the letter, but he say, let me know if you can attend. And if you're out of town, you can't attend, text me and I'll meet with you individually. So we joke, we text and we joke back and forth. But let me tell you something. I felt honored that the man of God would come to me and say, I need your help, and I may need you to open your pocketbook. Let me ask you a question. How would you feel if you got a letter saying, listen, I really need you to open your pocketbook. There's some stuff that's going on here, and God has shared it with me, and we're going to need some to go above and beyond where they are. Would you take that letter and stick it in the trash can? Pastor just wants some more money. <laughs> Guys, listen. <laughs> I can tell you what, how I feel. I can tell you what Barnabas did, but only you can tell me, and not even me, can tell God how you would feel about whether or not he can count and depend on you. That's what we're talking about, ain't it? We're talking about examining whether or not we're going to have a lasting legacy. Let's keep going because Barnabas was willing to do whatever he needed to do, and that's why we're talking about him today. And the reason that we're in this message is because God wants you to live a life where others are talking about you long after you're gone beyond EBC. Is somebody with me this morning? Because we need to go a little deeper. Let's go a little deeper. Let's bounce over because now you see where Barnabas started. Look at Acts chapter 9 and verse 26 and 27. Let's see if we can, we're going to track and follow Barnabas because look at verse 26 and verse 27. And here's what it says. It says, when he came to Jerusalem, now, I don't have time to go back and give you all the context. I just need you to mark it there, and you can go back and read it for yourself. Let me tell you what, who the he is. The he here is when Paul came to Jerusalem. You know, in fact, you know what? I, I, don't, I don't have a choice here. Um, listen, I want you to, let me, let's bounce back real quick to, um, uh, and I'm going to read this fast. So I'm going to start at the bottom part of verse 19 in chapter 9. Paul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. This is after Paul's Damascus Road uh, experience. And once he began to, at once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus was the Son of God. All who heard him were astonished, and they asked, wait a minute, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among all those that called on this name? And hasn't he come here to take uh, them as prisoners? to the chief priest, but yet Paul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. 
Now they want to kill him even though he went there to kill them. Listen, listen, listen. And so here's what happened. But, Paul, but Saul learned, everybody know that Saul is going to soon be Paul, but when I say Saul, think of Paul. So, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch at the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket and an opening in the wall. You say, well, why are you telling me all this stuff about Paul? I thought you, we were here to talk about Barnabas. Now read verse 26. When he, he being Paul, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. You see this? He wanted to go and talk to Peter and John and Andrew and Bartholomew and Thomas, but they were all afraid of him. Y'all not hearing me? Because they didn't believe he was really a disciple. This, these are the people who walked with Christ. These are the same people that Jesus told earlier that I'm going to build my church on. These are the same people. They were afraid of this guy. But look at here. Look at here. But then verse 27 says, but Barnabas. That's what it says. But Barnabas took him. And he brought him to the apostles. And he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and how the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Look what Barnabas told him. Look at verse 28. And he said, so Saul stayed with them and moved freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. You see what's happening here? Barnabas is now vouching for Paul, look at this, because I want you to see this. Look, so what do we know by this? Number one, he was not afraid of controversy. Let me say this before we go on. He was not afraid of controversy. Listen, we live in a time when many so-called Christians won't even call sin, sin. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to sound judgmental. They don't want to take a stand. They don't want to do any of that. And then some of the people who do speak out, they are so hypocritical that they don't, they, 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 they speak out, oh, homosexuality is a sin and you're going to go to hell. And then it ain't long before you find out that they got a gay boyfriend. <laughs> I wish somebody would really tell the truth. I wish somebody would tell the truth. There's so much hypocrisy that's going on. But your lifestyle has to be clean if God is going to use you to build a lasting legacy. And so Barnabas wasn't afraid, and Barnabas used his clout because the apostles, I told you earlier, they trusted Barnabas. He was not an apostle. He was not an elder. He was just someone that they trusted, and he wasn't afraid of controversy, and he saw what God was doing with Paul, and he was willing to get involved, and he knew, you know why he was willing to get involved? Because he knew that everyone had kingdom value, even that murderous Paul. He saw that Paul had value. Let me tell you, he saw that long before Peter long before John, long before Andrew, Barnabas saw that. And you know what he did? He put his reputation on the line. Paul could have been a plant. Paul could have been there to get on the inside and then destroy the whole church. But Barnabas knew that God was at work in this young man. And Barnabas knew that there was something about Paul that wasn't like everybody else. And Barnabas took him aside. That's not all. Let's keep going because you're going to see that. Look at, let's keep following him. Let's look at Acts chapter 11 because I want to read a little bit here. I'm going to start in Acts chapter, I'm going to start at verse 19 because I want that there's a lot that's going to go on right now. And, and, and we're going to walk right with him. So we're in chapter 11. And I'm going to start in verse 19. Here's what it says. It says, now those who had been scattered by the, per by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word 
only among the Jews. Now, there's a lot going on already. So I, I, I got to tell you, let me say this. Number one, you see that Cyprus, when I said earlier, I told you to remember, um, Barnabas was a Levite from Cyprus. So when Stephen was killed in Acts chapter 7, when Acts chapter 8 starts off, Acts chapter 8 verse 1 talks about how all of the church was scattered. But when you go back and read it, Acts chapter, one, ver Acts chapter 8 verse 1, it says the believers were scattered, but it says that the disciples and the apostles and the elders remained in Jerusalem. I want this to make sense to you. So, so when the people were scattered, they went every which way. And some of them went to Cyprus and some went to Antioch, but they spread the word only among the Jews. Listen to this. Let's keep going because there's a lot that's about to happen. Some of them, however, men that went from Cyprus and Cyrene, they went to Antioch and they began to speak to the Greeks also. I want you to see this. They start telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 21. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Let's go. Look what he says. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem. And look what they did. They dispatched. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. They didn't go. They sent Barnabas. Barnabas got a reputation that's so solid. And, but look at who they're talking to. They're talking about the Greeks. I'm going to say it one more time. The scripture says they sent Barnabas. They didn't go. They sent him. They weren't ready to go talk to these Gentiles yet. Come on with me. Look, keep going. Let's see what happened. Look at verse 23. And when he arrived and saw that the grace of, what the grace of God had done, he was glad and he encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all of their heart. Let's look what he says. Look, because here's the core. I'm right in the middle. So now you get to the core. Here's what churned everything in Barnabas. Luke said he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and full of faith. He just dropped that in while he's telling everything else. He said, I'm going to tell you what, what fueled Barnabas. He was a good man full of Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Let's keep going. Verse 25. He says, then Barnabas, look what happened. Then Barnabas, look what happened. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus looking for Saul. Let me go find that dude that God saved in Damascus and I mean, I think this is, look what it says. Keep going. Look at verse 26. And it says, and when he found him, when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, and look how, look how Luke wrote it, Barnabas and Saul. And I know y'all Bible believing, y'all uh, get fed well. So you know the, just, the juxtaposition of those words. When it says Barnabas and Saul, it starts with the greater. Barnabas was leading this effort with Saul. Barnabas was leading this effort with Saul. He went to get him, brought him to Antioch, and look what happened. And they taught great numbers of people, and it was there where the disciples were first called Christians. That was at the church at Antioch. We, and you know, because they needed a name to break out from the Jewish connotations to a brand new people. And that new people were Christian. They were no longer Jews who believed in Christ. They were Christian first who happened to be Jews. I wish somebody heard me. That's what it says. That's what this first happened in the church at Antioch. Let's keep going. Look at verse 27. And during this time, now some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Look what it says in verse 28. One of them named Agabus, he stood up and he started prophesying through the spirit and he said there's going to be a, a famine that's going to spread through the Roman world and this happened through the reign of Claudius. But look what happened in verse 29. The disciples, as each one was able, they decided to provide help to the brothers and sisters living in Judea. That same concept 
of believers, helping believers that started in the church in Jerusalem has now spread to the church at Antioch because, not because of some theory or because of some document, but because of folk like Barnabas. He said the people back there need help, let's help them. And verse 30 says, and so they sent their gift to the elders, the same elders who weren't willing to come, but they sent their gift from Barnabas and Saul. Do y'all start to see what's happening here? God uses who he chooses. What do we see here? Because a lot just happened. I got to move. But a lot just happened. What do we see from Acts chapter 11, verse 19 and 30? We see, number one, he was deeply committed to diversity. We're going to spend a lot, of, we're going to spend the rest of our time on this. He was deeply committed to it. He was willing to go wherever he was needed. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and he helped start the church at Antioch where the believers were first called Christians. We see all that right there. Hmm. All right, then you, you got all that. Then let's keep moving. Because let me tell you something. What you just saw happen is Barnabas went from somebody who was just there, who was giving, selling their goods and giving it to the church, to now you see he's a leader and a teacher. See, him and Paul taught there for a year. He's now a leader and a teacher. And let me tell you something, you see, before we move on. If EBC is going to have the legacy that God wants, if you're going to have the legacy that God created you to have, many of you are going to have to become something that you are not. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Barnabas didn't start off as what he was. He became a leader. And many in this body today, many who are listening to me online, God is trying to move you to become something else. I got to keep going. Look, let's look. Because I talked about the verse. Look at Acts chapter 13, the first four verses. Look at Acts chapter 13, the first four verses. Because we want to let's talk about the leadership uh, uh, of that church in Antioch. Verse, uh, verse number one, uh, chapter 13, it says, um, now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Let's look at who was there. The church at Antioch. They start with Barnabas. <laughs> Simon, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, we know those five, and you know that Barnabas, Manan, was, was with Herod, so we know that he was brought up as an aristocrat with the king, so we know that he's a politician. He had means, but God has now saved him, and you know Saul's background. So we know all three of them are Jews, but look at those other two dudes. No, no, go back. Look at Simeon, called Niger. You know, that can be translated Simeon, the black man. Niger is a country in Africa. Look at this. Lucius from Cyrene. Cyrene is what we now know of as Syria. Syria is a country from northern Africa. Let me explain something to y'all. When we are allowing God to open our eyes with respect to diversity across the whole spectrum, let me explain something to you guys. This is not a new thing that we're doing. We are trying to get back to where God started us. And we have split ourselves off because of the sin of human beings. Don't run away from what God is trying to do. This is where it started. It was not the church at Jerusalem that evangelized the new world. It was the church at Antioch. It was the church that spread because they went to the Gentiles, not just to the Jews. Look at this. Listen to this. I want you to see this. Look at verse 2. Now go to verse 2 because I want you to see this. And while they were there worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul 
Notice again, the just position of the word. The Holy Spirit didn't get it wrong. He said, Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas has now stepped in the lead position. For the work that I've called for them. Look at verse 3. And after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. And verse 4 said this. The two of them sent by on their way by the Holy Spirit went down through Seleucia and sailed there from Cyprus. What do we know from this? Okay. You know there already that his church leadership was diverse. You know that his ministry was to the Jews and the Gentiles. And you know that he was deeply committed to mission work. This is what we know. This is what we know. Let me tell you something. And I got to hurry. But let me, I mean, I, I got to get through this. But I, I want to I tell you this. Um, um, me and my um, sister Adams were talking about this last night. And, um, but I want to say something. Um, I think it was on Thanksgiving 2015. Um, if many of you were here, if you were here Thanksgiving 2015, when you heard me come and start preaching about Philemon and diversity. If you were here at that point, if you remember, raise your hand if you were here. Okay, that's good, that's good. That means I didn't run you off. But <laughs> no, the other thing is, because here, here's, what, here's what I'm saying. But the Lord started, I need to say this, the Lord started speaking to me on the importance of this in 2013. I was pastoring in Tampa. And then in 2014, the Lord moved me to um, California. And then in 2015, when I came and I shared with you guys from Philemon and what I was writing on and what, what God was talking about, about diversity, the importance of forgiveness and, 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 and reconciliation, we talked about this. And, but I want to tell you something. When I moved from Tampa, he showed me where to plug in in, in California. And here's what he showed me. That where I was to unite was, was with a predominantly white congregation. Very, very white. <laughs> there were five, including my family, five black families. The rest were white or Latino, or a few Asian. That's it. And I didn't know why, but I knew the voice of God. And I know now that he wanted me to go where I was needed, not where I was comfortable. And not one of my friends, pastor, or colleagues understood it. Even though everything that I'm telling you today is right here in the scripture, nobody understood it, but it was clear and the Lord had placed it in my spirit. And now, but the, script, the scripture was clear and the spirit was clear. But for me, now it's not even just where I am now. It's not just about a predominantly white or predominantly non-black congregation. But it, my requirement is that the church has to be completely committed to diversity. It has to be centered in diversity. It has to be moving toward diversity. Because if it is not, then the spirit isn't moving the way the spirit wants to move. To go now to an all-black church that's not trying to move or an all-white church that's not trying to move would be the same in this day as going to a church of all Jews who didn't want to reach out to the Gentiles. And God was having no part of it then, and he's having no part of it right now. But I'm going to tell you something, and i got to say it here because i got to keep moving. And I'll say it, and I've said it, and I'm going to say it again. Part of the reason that we don't see God moving in this area the way that he wants to move is because people are too stagnant. They get into a place and they don't want to move. They get somewhere and they get comfortable and they're too stagnant. And every time you look at the scripture, the church is on the move. People are on the move. And we wonder why we don't see this. It's because everybody is where they're comfortable. 
Barnabas was willing to go wherever he needed to go. And wherever he went, he set it up the way that God wanted him to set it up. Man, I got to keep moving. Because look what else what Barnabas said. Look at what he said. And, and I'm going to say this one more thing, then I got to move on. But listen to me. Listen to me. The wherever you go, it should be a hard requirement that diversity is at the center of everything that church does. It should be a hard requirement. And if you see that it's not, but yet God wants you there, that's happened to me too, then you realize that God sent you there to do that. Because sometimes, as I'm showing you today, sometimes the move comes bottom up, not top down. Barnabas wasn't an apostle. Barnabas wasn't an elder. Barnabas wasn't a preacher. Look, we got to keep going. What else do we see about Barnabas? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6, you saw that Paul was writing, and Paul said, well, why is it that, is it just me and Barnabas that we have to work? What do we see about uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6? Well, we see that Barnabas was willing to do whatever it took for the gospel. He wasn't opposed to being bivocational. If he needed to work a side job, he'd work a side job. He was willing to do whatever was required. What else do we see about Barnabas? Look in Acts chapter 15, because you you got it. We got to look at this. Look what he says in Acts chapter 15, verse 36. I want you to see this. Turn real quick to Acts chapter 15, verse 36. This is the apostle Paul talking about uh, what happened when he went to see the Gentile elders. And, and again, they're arguing about the same stuff we're arguing about today. They're arguing about diversity. And listen to what Paul said in Acts chapter 15, verse 36. He said, um, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let, no, 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 let, no, no, not that one, Acts, Acts chapter, yeah, Acts chapter 15 and verse 36. What we see here, um, th let, me get, let me get to this one. Acts chapter 15, verse 36. Thank you, Jason. What we see is that God, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of God. And, we'll, and, and see how they're doing. They've been on the first missionary journey. Now they're going to get ready to go back on the second missionary journey. But watch what happens here. You need to see this. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But listen to what Paul said. But Paul didn't think it was wise to take him because Barnabas had deserted them in Pamphylia on the last trip, on, on, trip, number, on, on trip number one. They're getting ready to go on trip number two. And, and, Paul, and Mark had not finished the work. But watch this. But the disagreement, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted companies. Now, wait a second. I thought Barnabas was this, this good man who was full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and now him and Paul are arguing. Look at what it says. Barnabas took Mark, and he sailed for Cyprus, but then Paul chose Silas, and, and he left. But look what happened. And they were commended by the believers for the, uh, of the grace of God. What am I trying to tell you? Look at what it says here, um, uh, what you're learning. He was clear on God's direction and his calling for his life. What does that mean? Number one, he was willing to put God's calling ahead of his relationship with his best friend. I told you about how close Paul and Barnabas was. Paul said, I don't think we should take Mark. Barnabas said, we're taking Mark. Paul said, well, I'm not taking Mark. Barnabas says, we're taking Mark. Let me tell you something. You know what Barnabas, do you know what Barnabas knew? Barnabas knew that there was something in Mark. The same way he saw something in Paul when nobody wanted to be around Paul, he saw that same thing in Mark. And Paul said, I'm not taking him. And Barnabas said, I'll do it. And you know what else they did? He wasn't, he knew how to disagree without being disagreeable, and they didn't fall out. Because at the end of the day, Paul ended up taking Silas, they went on these other trips, and Barnabas ended up taking Mark, and lo and behold, Mark is the one who wrote the first gospel. Mark is the one who wrote the gospel that Matthew and Luke and John depended on. That never would have happened if it hadn't been for Barnabas willing to go to bat for that young man. He was an encourager. 
He cared about people. But the last thing I got to tell you, because I got to stop, look in Galatians chapter 2. And I just want you to see this for yourself. In Galatians chapter 2, I want to read you three scriptures, but I'll start with the first one, because this is 14 years later, and Paul is writing this, and he goes up to Jerusalem, and he's telling the Galatians a story. Because the Galatians were really being hammered hard about they were there were lots of people were going to uh, to Galatia and they were telling them that y'all got to follow all these Jewish tradition and these Jewish rules and Paul said no you don't and they were causing all this trouble so Paul wanted them to understand that we've already worked that stuff out and look what he wrote to them he said 14 years ago he said this has already been handled he said I went up to Jerusalem and I, I this time I took Barnabas with me look what look what uh, Paul wrote. He said, and I also took Titus along, but he didn't stop there. Look at verse 9, because I want you to see what happened. He said, now later on, he said, when Peter, that's name, uh, uh, verse 9, when Peter came to, um, 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 to Antioch, uh, I'm sorry, verse, um, verse yeah, ver let's do verse 9. When James, Cephas, and John, they were esteemed pillars, they gave him and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. And they recognized the grace. This is where they said, all we need you to do is to remember the poor. But now look at verse um, 11 where we're trying to go. Because when, when Cephas, that's what they called Peter, when he came to Antioch, he said, Paul said, I had a problem with, Paul, with, with Peter when he came to Antioch. This is what he said. He said, I withstood him to his face. This is what he said. He said, he needed to be condemned. This is what he said. Well, wait a second, Paul. Are you talking about you're going to condemn you know, the head of the church, the one that Jesus said he was going to build his church on? Is that what you're saying, Paul? Paul said, but he was in the wrong. He said he was in the wrong. Look at what he said. I opposed him to his face. He said, for before certain men came from John, they used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, look what Paul said, then he began to draw back and to separate himself from the Gentiles. They start to discriminate. Them Jews didn't want to be seen with them Gentiles. He say, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group, the Jews. He say, the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy. Look what he said. Other Jews joined them in their hypocrisy. But look what he said. So that their hypocrisy, look what he said. Even Barnabas was led astray. I want you to understand something. You say, well, Pastor, why is it that you're telling me about how Barnabas was all wrong? Why are you telling me about his bad side? Because the last thing I want you to know, if you're going to build a legacy, is number seven, is Barnabas wasn't always perfect. I need you to understand something. Barnabas wasn't a know-it-all. I need you to understand something. Barnabas was willing to accept a rebuke from his disciple from disciple Paul that he had taken and trained and led around and taught but when Barnabas was in the wrong Paul said you in the wrong and so Barnabas said Paul you right and that's what we need we don't need some know-it-alls we need some people who are trained up other folks who are in the word who are willing to stand on the word so that when I'm wrong you can tell me I'm wrong But even with the respect that Paul had from Barnabas, you see what Paul said when he wrote this. You see that love that he had for him. You see what he said? He, he said, I called, I called Peter out. I called James out. But look what he said about Barnabas. He said, even Barnabas was led astray. He loved Barnabas. And that's what we got to do, folks. We got to bring up people who are willing to tell us the truth, and we got to be willing to stand on the side of truth. I got to stop, but listen to me, because what is it that we now know about this lasting legacy that Barnabas had on the church? Well, I'll tell you this. Well, without Barnabas, you could argue that the early Jerusalem church would have never had what they needed to succeed. Barnabas was there giving them everything they need. You can argue that without Barnabas, there would be no Paul. You know, understand, Paul wrote 13 letters. That's almost half the New Testament. You know, you can keep making your point that without Paul, there'd be no first gospel. Well, if there wasn't Mark, there probably wouldn't have been a Matthew. There may not have been a Luke. That may not have been a John, but you can see here that it's also you can keep arguing about, well, what about if there was no Barnabas? There'd be no church in Antioch. There'd be nobody to take the gospel to the Gentiles. It'll still be stuck 
over in Jerusalem and Judea. Thank God the gospel isn't stuck in Jerusalem and in Judea. But you can understand, without Barnabas, there'd be no first missionary journey. And if there was no first missionary journey, there'd be no second missionary journey. There'd be no church in Galatia, no church in Philippi, no church in Thessalonica, no church in Corinth, no churches all over the place. And without Barnabas, no Mark, you can argue that without Barnabas, we don't have the Bible as we know it. You say, but Pastor Al, you can't say that all this is at the feet of one man. Well, that's exactly why we need to have this conversation. Because as long as you walk around thinking that your contribution to the church and to the legacy don't matter, it's not that big of a deal, it's not that it don't matter that much, then you will never move on to be the person that God called you to be. Whoo, I got to stop. Listen, listen, listen. Listen, listen, listen. I'm going to tell you something. And, and I got to stop. I'm way out of time. But the, I, I, we started where Jesus told Peter, that you're right, that I am the Messiah, I'm the Son of God. And on that rock, you, Peter, y'all, disciples, I'm going to build my church. He did say that. And the scripture said in Matthew 17, it says about six days after that, it says that they were on a mountain. And Jesus only took three of them, Peter, James, and John. And he took them off with him, and they went with him, and he took them so far, and then he went on a little longer. And they saw him talking to some people, and they were glowing. They didn't know what they were seeing. They saw Jesus, and he was talking to Moses and Elijah. And the Scripture don't tell us what Jesus was saying to them, but the scripture does tell us what Peter said again. Remember I told you that the one who speaks isn't always the smartest one. And when they were out there, Peter said, wow, he fell to his knees. He said, we ain't never seen that like this. So it's, everything's glowing. And that's Moses and that's Elijah. Let's build a building and a shelter, one for each. One for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he was talking, the scripture says, Jesus didn't say it, but a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. Stop talking and hear him. And the thing that I did mention today was exactly what Peter said. We think that a legacy is about a building. I didn't talk at all about what buildings we have on this campus. And what was here 50 years ago and 70 years ago and then what we're doing here and all that. I thank God that we're expanding however we need to expand. But our legacy is not the building. And just like God told Peter, stop talking, we're not going to build anything. Because he knew that they didn't need a building because the church is in us. So as we think about our legacy and as we evaluate our legacy, remember the giver, the encourager, the teacher, the preacher became the apostle Barnabas. Remember his example. As you evaluate your legacy, on this church that God created and he promised us that even the gates of hell will not prevail. We're building blocks. We're the stones. We're the rocks that he used. And God uses who he chooses. Listen, I didn't make any of this stuff up. This is what the word says. And if the word says it, 
That's the way it is. Somebody say amen. amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we are so grateful that you are not like us. We thank you for this time and we thank you for your word. We pray that every word that has been spoken in this place today would resonate in our hearts and in our minds long after we leave this building. But right now, if there is one or more who have heard you speak today and they realize that they are not going in the direction that would leave a lasting legacy. In fact, if there's anybody who's listening today and they realize they haven't even started their walk. They've been around the church. They've been to the church. But that church that we discussed, that church that we talked about, does not reside in them. That spirit that we talked about does not live on the inside of them. If that's you today, and if you hear this, and you hear God, and you feel God tugging at your heart, and you've always said that there's going to be time, there's plenty of time, not today, maybe tomorrow, not tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe next month. Now is not the time. But I want you to know that the Lord sent me here today to tell you that he called you for just such a time as this. This is your day. And this is how you become part of EBC's legacy, is that you become part of EBC. You become part of that body, that church, that God has created, that he created on the foundation of broken men like you and me but empowered by his spirit. If there's anybody in this place today that clearly feel the Lord tugging at your heart, listen to me, listen to me. I've been right where you are. I've been right where you are. I've been right where you are. Don't believe the lies that you've got plenty of time. Today is the only thing that you know that you have. Come to Jesus while there is time, while today is still called today. Right now, don't be ashamed. Don't be timid. If you're willing to just stand up where you are, if you're just willing to stand, there were times when people were paralyzed and they would go to Jesus and they would bring them to Jesus and Jesus would say, first of all, just stand. I'm going to tell you to walk later, but he'd say, first thing to do is just stand. And if the devil and if your flesh, if everything around you has held you down and you haven't been able to stand, then this morning, I believe that if you will make an attempt I believe that the Lord will lift you up. Just stand where you are. Right now, in the name of Jesus, if there's anybody in this building, you may be online, you may be listening in. Still, if you're just willing to stand, you can come later. But if you're just willing to stand, if there's anybody today who don't know Jesus, in the pardon of your sin. Just stand and let him do the rest. Right now, the invitation is fully extended. You say, Pastor, I don't even know what it means, but I just know the Lord is picking me up. He's lifting me up. Then that's our job. We'll explain the rest because we've all been right there. But if you're just willing to stand, 
the Lord will do the rest. Whosoever will, just stand and let him come. The invitation is fully extended. Listen, let everybody say amen. Amen. Listen, um, I apologize for taking a little bit too much of your time. But um, take a look around at what's going on around us. We live in indescribable times right now. I'm not a prophet who can tell you that Jesus is coming tomorrow. I don't know that, Sister Brenda. I don't know it. But I can tell you that we are in the last stages of this. I can tell you that because that's what the word says. I can tell you that because I'm looking around. And I can tell you that when our time has expired, God is going to send his son. And at that time, whoever is in will be in, and whoever is out will be without. Time is wrapping up here. And I just pray that something that we've said today will encourage somebody to consider their relationship with Jesus Christ or their lack thereof. Thank you so much for your attention.